Welcome to you all to this, our webinar on online assessment. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, which I'm going to call INQUAHE from now on, because I can't keep saying that. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you all. Just looking at the chats coming in, we have a truly international global audience and um, this is our inaugural um, Inquahe webinar and uh, I guess it couldn't have come at a better time. Um, I'd also like to, from the outset, say thank you to the Distance Education Accrediting Committee who are supporting this webinar. Um, so, uh, reflecting, I guess, the global nature of this, um, we have some speakers for you this morning uh, from around the globe. Um, and I guess even though this is a global event, I mean, the coronavirus experience and the transformation we've been going through in the last few months certainly says to me that we have an awful lot in common. We're all interested in quality in higher education. We're all working through unprecedented change and we're all looking for ways to support our higher education institutions, our staff, and I guess especially our students. So I'm delighted to have today three speakers to talk on the topic of online assessment. Um, I have my Inquahe colleague, um, Dr. Leah Matthews, who's from the Distance Education Accrediting Committee in the United States, mm -hmm. and she's going to make a presentation. Following that, we have Dr. Dawn Gilmore, who's the direct, Director of Teaching and Learning in RMIT University in Melbourne. And she's going to respond to Leah's uh, presentation with some reflections on her own. And finally, we have Mr. Gonzalo Tomarelli Rubio. He is the Rector of IPLA CEX Technical Institute, and that's in Santiago in Chile. And he's going to also provide some reflections on Leah's presentation. I'm also hoping that we'll be able to respond to some of your, your questions. So please start the questions and keep them coming. We'll look and see if we can identify some key themes in those questions and try and reflect them back at the end of the webinar. We're also very aware that your time is precious and especially time online. So we are going to try and keep this within the hour. Uh, so I'm not going to take up any more of that precious time by introduce, with introductions. So I'm going to move directly now to my colleague, Leah, who's going to give a very interesting presentation <laughs> on online assessment. Off well, you thank, go, Leah. <laughs> thank you so much, Orla and Don and Gonzalo. What a pleasure it is to serve with you this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are um, on this Inquahe webinar. I'm going to just go over some practices and solutions for reviewing online programs, especially as they relate to newly emerging online learning solutions in response to the COVID-19. Um, I want to cover some basic areas of review and, and this presentation has in mind um, accrediting organizations, government agencies that work in quality assurance. Um, we're looking to share some strategies with you on how you might want to think about assessing online distance education programs, um, solutions that institutions are trying to develop as it's becoming increasingly more difficult for students to convene in a traditional classroom setting. The areas that I want to talk about are uh, how to disclose information to students, assessing academics, instructional design, the technology enterprise that an institution may use, and also just a few words about accessibility for digital learning. Let's talk just for a minute about how confusing and difficult this time can be for students as our most important priority and as quality assurance professionals we need to think about how guidance is being provided to students and how disclosures are being shared with students um, there should be good guidance 
where students can find all of the online course components provided in a conspicuous location. I know that this might seem obvious, but we should treat our students like they're almost a blank slate when it comes to technology. And what I mean is, just because students are adept at using mobile devices, using phones, using the internet, doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfectly well suited for online learning. And so there should be a very clear roadmap for how to access online learning components. Um, the technology requirements for online study should be very clear to students so they know what kind of bandwidth, what kind of equipment is necessary. Also, costs are very important. Some institutions are keeping their tuition the same, whether they're offering instruction online or in their traditional classrooms. Um, some institutions are adding costs for technology, for digital accessibility, those types of things. Again, students should have full disclosure as to what they're being involved in as it relates to online learning. And then if there's any prerequisites or competencies, um, good standards address what kinds of components and competencies need to be in place for students before they start learning. Let's talk for just a minute about academics. And this is probably the greatest challenge in any transition to online learning from a traditional classroom. You know, the curriculum and the content and the materials that are posted in an online learning environment really need to be just as comprehensive and just as rigorous in achieving the state of learning outcomes. There should be good learning assessment tools, whether that's through a proctored online exam, whether it's through written evidence, uh, perhaps it's through a group project or a presentation a student makes. You have to be creative and make sure that there's appropriate assessments for student learning uh, that's incorporated into the curriculum. Good online learning platforms provide a way for students to access um, progress on their achievements, how well they're doing in class, grading, feedback from the faculty, all of those components can also be built into the academic structure for online learning. One thing that has come up a lot and we're gonna to try to talk about today is assuring academic integrity and honesty. Um, what are the institution's policies for assuring in student integrity and academic honesty? What are some of the strategies that are in place to make these assurances for the students? And what kind of support and resources, whether it's tutoring or libraries or counseling, what are other kinds of supports available to students during this time? And then for faculty, is there training for faculty and are there very clear plans and support structures for them to interact effectively with students in online learning? Instructional design is when somebody with technical experience in converting curriculum to an online format interacts with a faculty member to change their course into suitable and appropriate and comprehensive learning models for distance education. I highly recommend that if you are working with institutions making a conversion to online learning, that they are working with qualified instructional designers. Uh, instructional designers know how to leverage technology and maximize the student experience in an online learning. We can do better than just PowerPoints going across the slide. And that's kind of the format we're using today, isn't it? But there are so many other ways to integrate technology into the learning experience that a, a good instructional designer can provide support for. Um, instructional design should also take into consideration the student feedback and what's their reaction and what's their response to the learning experience. Instructional design also makes use of expansive digital libraries, whether through a subscription program or perhaps a digital library that's already in place at a university can provide support for instructional design. Establishing a new technology enterprise can be daunting and expensive, especially if your institution hasn't made an investment yet in a distance education platform, the technology enterprise, which is the entire system for online learning can be a major challenge. Um, 
the technology enterprise has to make sure that there's good security features in place to protect student personal identification information, record keeping, and all of those aspects that may be typically done on campus. This can be done online, but there must be good security features in place. And faculty should be trained on how to use these functions, again, to make sure that there isn't any kind of compromise to the security and to the integrity and the safety of this information. Good planning involves good assessment internally. And so any digital aids or technologies or platforms that are used should be reviewed involving faculty to make sure that these technologies are not falling out of date or are still appropriate for teaching and learning. And the institution, I would recommend that they have a good technology plan that provides the quality assurance agency kind of the roadmap for how the institution is planning to evolve its teaching and learning using distance education. I want to say just a few words about digital accessibility. And I know that the United States is not the only place that deals with this. Um, there's always concerns about the appropriateness of online content, especially for those that may not have some of the accessibilities and the abilities to work online. And so, you know, this very rapid pivot to distance education may have left some, some students behind because, you know, of a disability that prevents them from using online learning. And so, something to consider as a quality assurance agency is whether you want to have standards around what is called digital accessibility in the United States. I'm not sure what it's referred to and other places that, um, you know, there are provisions in place to support students. Um, something as simple as a, a device that we call an e-reader in the United States. This is a tool that can be placed over a screen and then have an audio transmission as a result of the printed content on the page. So those are just some main ideas about how quality assurance agencies might want to establish some standards or some considerations of online learning that may be new to them, that may be new to their universities. Um, I'm happy to start looking at our chat, looking at our questions, but um, I'd love to hear from Don and Gonzalo. Orla, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Um, so thank you for, for this opportunity to give a short presentation and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Leah. And that was a really good whistle stop through the kind of major issues that I think everyone is kind of and test. It's a very simple solution and you should absolutely question if that approach would disadvantage any of the students in your cohort. Uh, another another um, interesting or I, I think fun approach that we found is that assessments don't, don't have to be time bound if you can um, use a tool that can randomize a question bank. Uh, so well-designed questions that invite students to use higher order thinking skills to answer these questions and about a question bank three times the size of what you'd need to complete the test so that you can make sure that it's random enough for each student to have a different experience. Um, a third approach is a multimodal assessment design and we, we do this one in lieu of proctoring. Um, so what, what that means is we pair things like multiple choice, short answer, a portfolio, or evidence-based assessment, we pair it with a video. Uh, so the purpose of the video is both to authenticate the student, um, who they are, and also for them to authenticate that indeed it's their work. So um, a student might upload their written work and that would be followed by a synchronous interview to defend the piece of work where their teacher could ask them questions on the spot that only the person that wrote the work could answer. Um, it promotes integrity, but it can be challenging to scale. Uh, the other example is that after a student uploads their work, they download questions and they complete a time bound video again to either randomly generated questions or pro forma questions that are designed in a way that only the person who, did, who, who completed the written work would be able to answer questions that require them to talk through their thinking process and approach, for example. And our fourth approach is authentic assessment. And this is probably the one that I would advocate the hardest for. So getting students to apply and create um, to, to a personal or 
prescribed situation. For example, we get students to build apps, solve a problem at work, draw on personal experiences, do all of those things in order to respond to assessment criteria. So, um, you know, for me, the ideal state is always to design an assessment so authentic that it's impossible to cheat. If you can Google the answer, you've designed a bad question, right? So an assessment should be the, not the first time that a student sees information, but it should be the first time that a student applies the information to a context. And this is the boundary crossing um, that makes authentic assessment tick all the boxes for higher order thinking. It also is part of 21st century learning skills um, in that um, it's not about finding information or recounting information, but what you do once you have it, how you evaluate it, and how you apply it across context. So when we move when we move courses online, these are the sorts of assessments that we work through with academics, and of course their their responses. But how can I make sure my online students don't cheat? I never know quite why it, that question is specific for online students, but it is. Um, and, and it's interesting because research shows, I mean, we can go back to, to, to research from Tinto 1982 um, or even um, current research on retention and online learning, BAWA 2016, I can even pop that one here for you. Um, and um, students often cheat because of self-efficacy. They don't think they can be academic enough uh, and because of time management. So if we're looking at the, at the assessment through a small lens, then we're almost looking too narrow. We have to think more holistically if we don't want students to do things like cheat. So things that we do, um, we, we have a balance of just enough hoops in place for students to jump through, like uh, plagiarism software, like Turnitin, um, to check for similarity ratings. The other one um, is small class sizes. And I think this is probably one of the more effective solutions, but often overlooked because of the cost and scale. Um, so if you can increase teacher to student contact time, you start to build trust between students and teachers and students won't want to cheat. And also teachers will know their students well enough to identify if they're cheating or struggling and get them the resources that they need. So we look at supporting classes of one to 25 for complex areas and then one to 45 for uh, like an intro level course or undergraduate. Uh, and thirdly, um, thinking about safety nets. So what sort of early warning systems you can have in place. So the first assessment of the student's experience is the biggest indicator of success for the rest of their degree. Um, how do you capture that data and make sure you can carry it along to use it at the right spot, along with pairing it with logging into LMS within the first 48 hours of a course, having clicked on hotspots in a course, like the assessment page, having completed a low stakes activity within the first two weeks. Um, so if you think about these data points, how do you grab these symptoms together and reach out to those students proactively so that you can get them whatever the resources that they need are for around academic skills or time management. Um, it's about the safety net in place. So um, I want to move into now the socialization of, of assessment. Um, so our highest performing courses and our highest performing teachers are the ones where the assessment rituals are socialized throughout the course. And I think that when we look at assessment, again, we think of the end game and not the journey. So this is about the journey. Um, so the practical socialization of and for assessments throughout the learning experience means preparing students for assessments and creating opportunities for preparation and feedback. And this starts from the moment students enter a course. So preparation, what are we doing to make sure that um, to prepare students for assessment throughout the learning experience? Um, again, like I said earlier, an assessment shouldn't be the first time they're seeing the information. So what, there are two ways to accomplish this. Um, teachers should be facilitating learning cycles each week um, and in webinars and discussion boards. One of the ways that we do this in our webinars is we use, uh, it's called a 4E learning approach. So we ask the teachers to take an approach to their webinar where they go through four steps, engagement, exploration, explanation, and evaluation. Um, so engagement ensures that you're connecting a personal connection between the students and the content, content in a diagnostic way, exploring, exploring it in the context, um, maybe a personal context, um, ex explaining, making a link to the theory and literature and evaluation, some sort of informal self-reflection or low stakes quiz to see how students' understanding is gauged. So if you start to do um, those sorts of 
learning cycles weekly, then when a student goes to an assessment, it, they're just applying their learning cycle in a different context, which again, links back to higher order thinking. Uh, and again, I can give you a nice little resource on how to do that as well. I'll just copy it into the chat box. Um, so the, the other one is feedback. So what are we doing to shape our students feedback literacy so that they're prepared for assessments feedback needs to be a tool to enhance learning again from day one. Um, affected fe effective feedback should be present in discussion boards in webinars and informative assessments so that students are always on a pathway to the assessment um, for this to occur. Um, we ask for feedback to have three to answer three questions um, and this is this is not my framework. This is one that we borrow from uh, John Haiti and Helen Timberley called the power of feedback. So the first one is feed up, which is where am I going? And this responds to students goals and their intrinsic motivation. It's linking their performance to the bigger picture. Um, maybe it's employment, maybe it's a good grade, um, but it appeals to students intrinsic motivation. The second question is, is feedback. So how am I going? Um, so this is how the student's doing at a task or an assessment. It's performative, it's feedback on the spot about what you've done. And the third one is feed forward, where to next? So linking current performance to future performance. So a well-designed online assessment is foreshadowed by ongoing feedback. And this is important in online spaces, um, especially where messages can be easily misinterpreted learners are more vulnerable when they're being assessed and they're more likely to be overstretched, especially during a pandemic. Um, so ongoing uh, feedback scaffolds a better assessment experience. So it's important to consider that again, hol is that a timer? Um, <laughs> holistically. Uh, and that's where I will end. Um, I will pass it back to Orla. Thank you, John. And um, sorry, I was just so interested in your conversation. I was really disappointed when that alarm went off. But we do want to hear from Gonzalo as well. And um, I know Gonzalo, Gonzalo has a lot of experience to share with us from um, his institution in um, Chile and maybe um, some kind of differences maybe to the Australian experience. I'm not quite sure, but I'm very interested in hearing your reflections, Gonzalo. Also, can I just say before we move on, some great questions coming through, so please keep them coming. And um, I'll hand over to Gonzalo now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, First of all, I would like to say thank you to, to Leah, to Orla, to Sana. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you some ideas and to discuss such an interesting thing. I think Incuaje is, is, is doing something very important here. So thank you again and good morning. Uh, I would like to say a few words about two different things. Um, briefly, First is the emergency remote delivery. Uh, since March, at least here in Chile, probably since January or something in the rest of the world, uh, our academic year starts on March here. So oh, since March, all the higher education institutions in Chile had to rapidly move their academic activities from traditional system to a remote teaching. Um, on one hand, I think this is a big opportunity for distant learning. Traditional academia have always been reluctant to accept e-learning as a valid alternative, uh, but all of a sudden they are all using it. It's very popular. Everybody is happy about them. Everybody is talking about good things about uh, distance education. Uh, so I think, in one hand. Uh, this is a big opportunity, uh, but on the other hand, it is a risk. Uh, most of the universities are simply using video conference softwares to broadcast the, the very same traditional classes. Uh, and, he, and we need to be very careful because for sure students are not going to learn what they should and faculty can be disappointed. 
Uh, so we need to address all the things that Leah uh, told us, uh, let's say instructional design, uh, the assessment design. It is not just uh, start broadcasting or using video conference to, 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 to give or to offer the very same traditional classes. This is a mistake uh, and, and it's very important. My concern here is the idea that online education is being rapidly implemented at the expense of quality. Uh, this may result in online education being discarded after the outbreaks end, uh, and that's not good. Uh, I, I would like to think about this about an, like an opportunity and not like a risk. I mean, uh, going online has to be carefully planned and faculty members need to need more support than a simple operation notice justifying uh, by an emergency declaration. Uh, so it is, it is very important to think about this and to do all the things we need to do uh, because there is a risk here. At least in Chile, uh, less than 4% of the total higher education system enrollment is uh, online enrollment or distance education enrollment. Uh, we have like 1.2 million students in the whole higher education system and only 4% of them are enrolled on online programs. It's been growing very fast, probably like 20% during the last four years, uh, but uh, it, has, it is still just a few students considering the whole system. And we need to be careful on this opportunity. Uh, one of the most important things uh, to, to, to provide a quality online programs or distance education programs for me, and, and I would like to talk a few words about instructional design, is the idea of keeping aligning, aligned three different things. On one hand, learning objectives. Uh, second, the teaching methods we use. And finally, assessment techniques. Uh, if we can keep these things aligned, uh, the students find it difficult to escape without learning. Uh, uh, assessing techniques needs to be aligned to learning objectives and teaching methods. Uh, in IPLAS e X, uh, we, were, uh, we are implementing an instructional design model in order to keep these three, three things aligned. Uh, initially, we implemented uh, what we called a uh, bi-dimensional model or bi-dimensional matrix. So for each learning environment or learning context, we combined uh, with a, and combined with a learning, uh, learning level, let's say using the Bloom taxonomy, for example, we use, we use certain teaching methods. It's, it's, it's not what, what, whatever, it's you, you need to, you need certain teaching method considering the, the learning level and the learning environment. We, we use different learning environment, but mainly let's, let's call it traditional or online learning environment. Uh, but you need to pick the, the certain uh, teaching methods considering these two things. Of course, the idea is to be sure we use the teaching techniques that maximizes learning. Uh, but then, since last year, we are trying to introduce a third axis or a third dimension to our matrix. So uh, there is not only a right, the right teaching methods or instructional resources, let's say, but also the right assessment techniques. Uh, the thing is, a common mistake here is to think that we have to use uh, as much resources or as much technology as possible. So the teaching techniques always have to include sophisticated uh, multimedia or vi virtual reality. Uh, and the evaluation techniques must include super proctoring software or adaptive assessment software. Um, no, 
the, the most important thing here is learning uh, and you need uh, the right technology for best learning and how to be sure uh, to get the best learning is keeping aligned the learning objective the teaching methods and the assessment techniques uh, of course uh, the 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 way to 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 check if this is going working is uh, uh, learning outcomes uh, as a first step uh, re average um, results from students can be uh, a way to see if it's working uh, but next step is of course trying to use uh, more data we've got tons of data from the LMS or whatever uh, so we can say depending on what resource what te what technique or what strategy are we using uh, students are getting best learning outcomes so uh, if a student is uh, watching two or three times this video they are getting better results okay that's okay but it doesn't matter how many times or how how long the student uh, uh, work or read this paper oh that's different so the interesting thing is using as using uh, uh, sorry the interesting here is using the learning outcomes to identify the best technologies or the best resources the, i think this is two interesting thing to discuss emergency remote delivery and instructional design uh, for for distance learning and assessment That's it, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Gonzalo. And um, I'm, I'm just monitoring, sorry, I was a bit distracted there. I was just monitoring some of the questions coming in. But I, I just want to summarize what we've heard before we move to the questions. And I think um, even though each of our speakers has taken a slightly different perspective, there's a lot of kind of commonality across all three. Um, and I think it's just exactly what uh, Gonzalo was just saying there around taking integrated approaches, um, aligning between your kind of delivery, if you like, and your assessment to make those consistent and using the tools that are there that you already have in place, things like learning outcomes and policies in relation to assessment that you can utilize for an on online context as well. I think we also heard how it's a balance, particularly a balance between um, retaining human contact, if you like, and staying engaged and using technology, that there is a balance to be struck there and that, that that's something sometimes you have to feel your way through with your student group. I think we got some very practical solutions from Dawn. We got some deeper questions from Gonzalo, particularly around the risks that we're facing in relation to this. And we kind of got a broader, if you like, more detached quality assurance perspective from Leah. So I think that's a very rich basis upon which to have our discussion. I'm looking at the questions coming in and there are a few that are coming to my mind, um, a few themes, if you like. One of them definitely is uh, around disadvantage and mm -hmm. a whole new raft of people now who are disadvantaged because they don't have connectivity. So we can't assume that everyone is on the same kind of platform or basis for participation. Uh, and in many cases, we're not talking, uh, even with COVID, about a wholly online piece. It's, it's usually some form of blended learning. And I'm just wondering whether our speakers have any reflection on that, on that balance and how to establish it and also what does and doesn't work in terms of um, reaching people who, who may be disadvantaged or who may be if you like, made further vulnerable because sure. of learning online. 
So I might, yeah. And even got the Leo, you have your hand <laughs> I, up. I might pass over to yes. you first. Um, I'd love to address that and also hear from Don and Gonzalo. Um, the best online learning platform in the world will not serve your students if your students can't access it. And I saw lots of concerns in our chat um, about students that may not have access to the internet, they may not have the technology that is, is needed. Um, how do we serve these students? Um, I will just share what I've heard have been some solutions to that problem. Um, one solution has been to find a very large space, maybe through the government or through the university itself, to park um, a server, to park um, a wireless network where students can come with their devices, download the content that they need for their classes, maybe exchange some emails with their faculty, um, and then go back home with their laptop. So it's like these stations, these portals, where you can take your equipment, power up, log in, obtain your content, exchange whatever electronic communication you need, and then go back home. And so it's not a synchronous learning environment for those students, but it is a way for them to access their content and have some communication with faculty if there are very strict social distancing provisions in place. For students that don't even have the right equipment, um, I have heard that we are that that some areas are using as best they can uh, written materials, printed content, printed content mailed to students, um, uh, sealed envelopes with examinations that are sent to a proctor who signs off that they have observed the student complete this assessment. It's put back in a sealed envelope and sent back to the university. I know that sounds very rudimentary, but let's try to keep the process moving forward for these students. I know I spoke a lot about technology enterprise, instructional design, and all of these things in my presentation. And these are components that really should be in place when the university has the technology access and the students. But if the students can't get online, this is not going to work for them and we must come up with more creative solutions. And it's the responsibility of the Quality Assurance Agency to ask those questions. Thanks, Leah. Um, I can see Dawn nodding vigorously as you're speaking there. Um, Dawn, do you want to come in with any comments around that? Just that you described a very similar situation um, to what we were, to what we experienced as well. Um, so um, we set up a call center to reach out to the students that self-identified as needing that. So phone was their main source of um, communication or um, the line into the uni um, and then managed um, getting content and assessments out by burning CDs. Um, I call it a jump drive, thumb drive. I don't know what people call it these days. Um, one of those small thumb drives that you can plug into your computer, printing self-addressed envelopes for it to come back and forth. Um, uh, but it was, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, you described a very similar situation to what we experienced as well, Leah. So very similar strategies. Um, I mean, what, one of the things we're exploring here in Ireland is whether we can actually um, tap into, we have a, a lot of multinational companies in the tech space whether we can work with them to make make a de devices available maybe via a lending scheme or some kind of a library scheme so that people can actually access something that they don't have at the moment. Uh, Gonzalo, I think you wanted to come in as well. Um, so I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Yeah, just to share with you our experience here in Chile. Um, a small part of our students are not fully online, uh, but uh, what we have done is we, we get them a chip with connectivity. Everybody can get a, a cell phone here at least. Uh, so we pay for them for a connectivity, let's say, uh, 
chip for of like a phone chip so so they they got their internet access uh, from the institution it's not so expensive uh, you don't need to to give them the whole device just the connection the the plan uh, so we 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 gave like thousand chips that's it and on the other hand fortunately we do have like a, a national network of infrastructure we have offices not big big campuses but small offices all over the country like 12 offices and the the students can get there and get online or or go through the authentication processes and that can help them so having this this infrastructure actually was very important in this situation yeah i think you're right i think some countries you know where where they've had kind of remote infrastructure in place to reach students more remotely have, have been able to kind of um they have something to fall back on in in this situation um, I'll just share one other piece from here, which is um, that uh, I, this was news to me <laughs> um, before COVID, but um, apparently some websites are, are categorized as a zero rating for data usage. And, and you can talk to um, data providers around categorizing educational websites as zero rating, which means it, it, it does not cost, um, it does not eat data to use those websites for students. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to move on to another theme, if that's okay, it's coming through. The, um, there are a, a few themes, but another one I seem to have picked up on in quite a few questions is the whole area of assessment that does not easily translate to an online mode. So um, just reading the side, um, the, the comments coming in, things like practical skills, which are often linked to professional accreditation for various programs, but also core skills, if you like what we call transferable skills, you know, things like teamworking, et cetera. How, how, have you any practical suggestions or even deeper thoughts uh, around the assessment of those kinds of skills. Um, I'll maybe start with Dawn this time, if that's okay. Sure. So uh, the first thing is to imagine the classroom beyond the classroom. So um, with things like soft skills, can you get students to run an experiment and report back? Um, even with some of the, the science, um, like if you're studying biodiversity, can you send students somewhere locally for them to map out an area uh, and talk about the flora and fauna in that space? There's a university in Australia that does um, exercises like that. We also um, have a university here that even runs forensic, um, a forensic course online and also um, sends students out locally in their neighborhood to map out and walk the way that you'd map out a forensic scene. Um, they take photos and they report back. Um, and also thinking about, so if your students are working, what can they ask their colleagues at work and report back on? Um, for, the, for, for skills like in, in medicine and nursing, like, um, you know, if, if, you, if you need to practice putting a needle in someone's arm, like, I don't think that there's a substitute for that. Um, and we do, we have identified courses at the university that we do need to bring back because certain skills are irreplaceable and we'll do so using social distancing and, and rosters to manage that. Um, but I think the other, um, the, that there are lots of other opportunities uh, when we think outside of um, who our classmates are. So who are our offline classmates while we're studying and how can we use them to practice our content material on and report back into the formal university. Okay, some great um, practical suggestions there um, from Dawn and some good ideas. And I, I think this is really about opening up maybe your um, understanding and imagination on assessment. Um, to, and, and if you have a good 
kind of framework within which to work as was highlighted by Gonzalo, I think, you know, this idea of aligning learning outcomes, assessment, um, delivery, then that should give you the confidence and if you like the integrity to kind of pursue different assessment strategies to reach the same point, if you like. Leah, would you like to um, reflect on this question? Oh, sure. Uh, the question of how to serve our students preparing for the medical profession is on everybody's mind because the practical settings for learning just are not available. And right, so how do you do the nursing practica or the surgical technician practica or physical therapy when, when you just can't work in close proximity? Um, this really needs good engagement with the professional associations and the licensure bodies, you know, how are they adapting their organizations and what kind of guidance are they offering um, in terms of the, the profession itself. And so, um, at least in the United States and in working with the profession-based accreditors, um, there has been a lot of interaction about, you know, where other models, whether through video conferencing or artificial intelligence, can we reach students with some practical experiences? Um, where are we willing to maybe overlap more with the profession itself um, and get students into the field under very, very close supervision. Um, we need trained medical professionals right now more than ever. Uh, so, so this is a, a major, major concern. Uh, but, but I think the education community has to link itself to the professional community and build that bridge for students right now during this this very difficult time and the the role of the quality assurance agency of course is to observe and understand and assess the student learning component of building this this bridge during a very unusual time for students in fields that have kind of that that human touch component Thanks, Leah. Um, actually, that segues really nicely into my next question, which is, um, and there, there are a few questions around this, what, what do quality assurance agencies need to do? Um, what, 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 um, what, what should they be changing in, in, in response to this? Should they be changing anything? I mean, there's a good few questions there around you know, the kind of expectations um, and questions that uh, we create, the guidelines that agencies create for higher ed institutions or programs or faculty. So what, what changes on that front? Um, Leah, can I go back to you and then hopefully we'll get Gonzalo mm -hmm. back online yeah. <laughs> seeing him uh, and we can ask him uh, as well. Thanks, Leah. Sure, sure. Well, accrediting agencies certainly have had to do their own adapting and modifications um, since such a key feature of our process is getting on site to the university. Even accreditors that work in distance education like DEAC and my organization have had to adapt. And so we have taken on a process that we are referring to as virtual visits virtual assessment. We're conducting our meetings with university presidents and staff and administration via Zoom. We're gathering information from faculty, um, again, using video conferencing. We're using secure sites to post records that our accreditation teams can evaluate. But, um, you know, the process has to continue. And we have to continue our work of evaluating institutional effectiveness, um, especially during this time. Uh, there's been a lot of meetings among accrediting organizations in the US to address how we're moving forward with our kind of virtual visit process and also been very engaged with our government. You know, the US Department of Education um, has been providing guidance to the accrediting bodies on how we can continue our work um, without having that on-site component of our assessment practice. Thanks, Leah. Um, I was thinking, Gonzalo, sorry, we lost you for a short <laughs> while there. Um, but we were just talking about, you know, what do quality assurance agencies 
need to change. And I just thought, actually, I might ask you, well, what would you expect a quality assurance agent, agency to be changing or doing differently as a result of this? What would you like to see from a quality assurance agency around this? I think you're muted there, Gonzalo, sorry. Hello? There, okay. So I think National Accreditation Commission is, is moving fast in this situation. Um, as a first step, they uh, communicate the whole higher education system. Um, they are planning to implement different schedule for this year, uh, depending on your processes, uh, date, um, date lines, date, uh, are moving and there is an, a new calendar for the year so so institutions like us um, can change their schedule and we are expecting a delay of about six months on the whole process uh, but on the other hand they are rapidly moving to uh, online procedures um, they are talking about visiting uh, hybrid methods of visiting with uh, some visiting at, at on site, but most of the process being online. We do have like a docu um, shared documents online since last year. So this is gonna be easy. Uh, but then um, of course, I think it's a big challenge. And not, not everybody agree on this, let me be sure. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about what's going on and, and, and what can we do about that? Uh, but I think it's it, it, everything is going to get better on this because he, historically uh, the process uh, needs to be changed. You know, it needs to be. We need to use more technology, and that's going to be good. I, I think it's an opportunity. I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Um, I, I think there's there's potential long-term benefit. Some, some of the changes we're seeing were kind of in the ether for a long time anyway. And, and this is just kind of up the ante on them a little bit. Um, Dawn, can I ask you, I mean, in terms of say, the expectations around quality assurance, the kind of the, the standards, if you like, do you think there's any impact of this on them? Uh, I think that there will be pockets um, where their standards are, are not met, but also there'll be pockets where standards were probably exceeded. Um, so uh, our government, for example, our, our, our QA agency here took a service leadership approach. Um, they got out there very quickly and they uh, curated best practice resources and then they put them into six themes and if you were I, I, I'd wager a guess that that will be the, the quality themes that will start to emerge over the next two years and the standards will be the resources that they've put into each one. It'll be about codifying them. Um, but by doing it through, by kind of stepping back as assessors and saying, here's a community and, and like we put together these resources, we used a community to do it. It's a soft approach to help people engage with that so that when they have to come in as the quality holder, people will be ready and possibly even prepared because they may have started engaging with those resources early on um, but all of our audits are, are currently on hold thanks very much Dawn um, I have one more question but we're, we're really <laughs> going to run up onto the wire around this and if it's okay I'm going to do a very make it a very quick one if you one priority around this, what would it be? What is the change, the one thing that you think uh, everyone should focus on to make the quality of online assessment better? Um, and it can be one very practical thing, or it can be a policy change, or it can be a change to a standard. What is that one thing that you might do 
Sorry for springing that on you, panelists. Um, who'd like to put their hand up first to answer? <laughs> Um, uh, no, okay, I'm going to I'll volunteer, go. Leah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm most concerned about students and where they are and how they're accessing learning. And so I think what quality assurance agencies can do, and they're likely already doing this, is gathering data from their institutions about their student enrollment patterns, their retention patterns, their uh, students' ability to have access to technology. By now, we should all be gathering data that will help us formulate our solutions for the fall term. <laughs> that's great, and that's a very simple tip, and it's something people are doing already. They have the systems there, so it's just to use the information. Um, Dawn, would you like to? Give us your one priority. I'd like to see a, um, a continuous improvement mindset to be adopted so that quality isn't an exercise that we do when, when the calendar year tells us to, but something that's embedded in our practice. Um, and as a sector, we all had to, worldwide, we all had to get online together. And now we're at a unique moment where we can all experience continuous improvement together. And there was no other way that would have brought the whole world of universities together on that cycle so how can we leverage that that's great uh, and thanks dawn um, i mean keeping continuous improvement at the center of this it doesn't go away when you move online it becomes more important than ever gonzalo um for me orla the more more important thing here is learning we need to be sure that our students are learning and we need to prove that distance education or e-learning uh, can help students to learn. So measuring not only the results from students, but the, the ability of our online systems to develop the competencies in our students is the most important thing. So assessment, not only to assess the students, but to assess our own uh, technical ability to develop the competences on them. Thank you very much. I mean, I think this is a lovely way to wrap up the session. It is all about okay. learning mm -hmm. and using data, using information to inform that and taking an attitude of continuous improvement. There isn't a better way to sum up what we're doing, so I'm not going to even try. I'm just <laughs> going to thank all of the um, the three panelists. If, if we were in a, a human session now, we would give them a round of applause. So I'm going to do that on your behalf and just say this has been such an enjoyable experience. Uh, Mind-blowing, actually, to see all these comments coming in yes. from all around the mm. world and so many people so passionate and so interested in quality of higher education. So please, everyone, stay safe and join <laughs> us for our next webinar. And yes. very nice spending time with you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.